morning and welcome to To The Point. It is Tuesday, September 1st, 2020. Thank you to those of you joining us across the various platforms across the region, the rest of the world. Happy to have each and every one of you joining us this morning. And this morning, our guest is political leader of the National Democratic Congress, Mrs. Franca Alexis Bernadine, and she's here to talk about issues of national importance, with sp specifically, I would focus on education. Good morning, Mrs. Bernadine. You're hearing me? No, I'm not. Morning, morning, ah, morning, there we go. everyone, to all your guests. Yes, I can hear you quite clearly you now. Thank you very uh, much so for joining us. to everybody. All right, let's get right into the discussion. Um, September is the month that has been highlighted by the Ministry of Education for the reopening of schools across the country. And as a former Minister of Education, I'd like to get your thoughts on the plans that have been highlighted so far by the education officials for the reopening of schools later this month. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me start by saying that, that we are in exciting times blossom because we're challenged at the best of times there are several challenges but this time around of course we have the whole issue of covid and um, the virus and what is happening at that level and i am certainly have been following the ministry's planning process and um how they envisage all of this happening and so on and there are certainly challenges but we can also benefit from the experience of of several um, groups of persons, particularly so the principals. I did not find they were as well involved as they should have been from the start, because they are the people who actually manage the school, and they are the ones who could make it happen, because there are a lot of practical details that one has to be sure are in place to be able to move ahead with this. Now, we had done a program prior to this last Monday, actually, in which we looked at some of the concerns and challenges that could potentially emerge. Of course, um, what in particular is of concern is the fact that we are not only embarking upon the, the platform to be able to, the digital platform, to be able to instruct children, but also to the fact that the books um, only a few are available, and so it has sort of left us on a half-and-half half, um, position, where some of the subjects will be covered by books, apparently, and at least some information will be coming in on the tablets, and that in itself is a challenge. But um, there's also concern about the teachers uh, being comfortable one thing is to train them and to teach them uh, how to use the platform. But at the same time, they too have to be comfortable because they're instructing children and receiving information. And so um, they're uh, not quite at the level of comfort with respect to that is also for concern. Of course, basic things like the internet um, availability. And while the minister has assured, because I remember we shared that in addition to our concerns with respect to the internet, we, during the NDC time, had put in place in the community centers access to the internet so that doing homework and other um, activities could happen. Understanding everybody does not have internet. Um... Sorry about that. Of course, somehow it always <laughs> escapes what you, with good intentions. Good. That has taken care of that. Yes, that, that in actual fact, internet access is going to be an issue. So while I know the ministry is glossing it over very nicely and indicating that it should be fine, everybody should have, and so on. It's not quite going to be that way at all. I think there are going to be quite a few challenges, but I'm sure if we work together, um, we will have no choice. We have to make it happen for the children. I also wanted to clarify a bit on one of the proposals that I had suggested, which was the shift system. And perhaps it needed a bit more explaining. Um, very briefly, because they're not going to use that anyway. 
But I worked, for example, in Jamaica for a period of time. One year when I was working on my master's, I worked with the shift system at Excelsior School. Worked very, very well. One set of children came to school from 7.30 in the morning until 12. I taught in the afternoon shift, which was 12.30 to 5. So it's a totally different set of children, but it gave everybody an exposure every day. Because, you see, the challenge remains that if they come one day, don't come another. There are a number of issues. One, the um, interrupting um, flow for the children. And two, the challenges for the parent to find coverage for them while they are at home. But I wanted to reassure whoever thought that it was one teacher standing there from 7.30 until 5. That's quite incorrect. It's two different shifts of teachers as well as. And it meant, therefore, that they had to bring in a few teaching assistants. So they were interspersed with staff in the morning, and then they were interspersed in the afternoon. Some of us were able to, for example, on certain days, I came in at 11.30 and taught the chemistry class from 11.30 to 12.30, and then stayed on for the chemistry class that was later on in the day, three to four, as the case may be. So they worked very well for years. They had, had to introduce that during the Gilbert crisis for them, when there was Hurricane Gilbert. And uh, it's a very good system, and also, too, when your numbers are large, your school has to operate almost as two sets of schools, and the principals know how to balance that and handle that. So, but with all in all, with the children having to learn how to um, physically space and also to wear masks, it's quite a challenge, and it will prove to be that. So I think we must be realistic in what to expect, rather than be too optimistic and sort of glossing over what are likely to be the issues. But I wanted to clarify that with respect to the school system, because I know some people thought that the suggestion was that a teacher um, could teach from 7. You can't. You know, there's nobody that can teach that long, continuously, 7.30 to 5 every day, five days a week. That is not what it was at all. The other issue I wanted to clarify was a comment with respect to the laptops and the tablets that are presently being used. And I want to say very clearly that on the 12th of July, and I have the file here right with me, um, the 12th of July 2012 was when um, the Ministry of Education negotiated an arrangement with Digicel. To, they were going to provide the laptops and the tablets, and um, that's the day the meeting was held. The entire agreement is here in my file. And so the NDC had moved to introduce the tablets back in 2012. What we recognized was that the teachers themselves, in doing a sampling of the main secondary schools even, we found, like, for example, in St. Joseph's Convent, about six teachers out of the staff of 42 were in fact able to use the, the tablets and the, um, and the system to instruct the children, put the classes on to work with them and so on. So the teachers clearly needed their skills upgrading. And we quickly wrote off to the OAS and got a grant for teacher training. And it began and continued through into the following year because we had to be sure that they were ready um, for when the tablets arrived. So I want to break the myth that this is something that the, the government, present government introduced and so on. This was well on its way. And I venture to say, Blossom, had the government followed through, we could have been in a much better position and much further ahead than we are now. Because I do recall very clearly the campaign in 2018, when in fact the, the tablets, the books were out and the tablets were definitely on. Here we are seven years later, and the tablets are only getting there, and we're scrambling around to train the teachers. And this is one of the flaws in our system. Continuity is absolutely essential in education. It doesn't matter what government comes or what government goes. Whatever a good policy is there, they must continue. We must continue to address them. And had that been the case, it would have been introduced right back in 2012, 2013, after the three training co um, cohorts were in place, and um, 
we would have been happily using tablets or no into the program. Instead of that, this is where we are. Um, likewise, and, to, and by the way, I want to just offer congratulations to SAS. I saw where they are, have set up their website, a very, very good and very, great initiative, but it's one secondary school. Okay, there are 22 others. So we must bear in mind, very good, but we're moving along painfully slowly. And, and I believe it's because the support that is needed at that level um, has not been there. You know, in terms of, of education uh, progress, I am quite concerned myself, Lassa. Things, for example, like the technical education that have we introduced three subjects into the primary level system. Who to start with? Woods and um, well, food. It's it's a type. It's food and nutrition, but it's a combination subject. Um, home care. There are other aspects to it, but these two technical areas were introduced back in two thousand and ten, because the jobs according to the World Bank report, school and work in the Eastern Caribbean. And um, other excellent sources advised us that uh, technical education was going to be where the jobs are at until 2040. But we have not seen that sort of development at all. I would have thought that having introduced it back into the primary schools, and we got great support, particularly from the diaspora, in Britain, where we would not have had enough to get every school up to its level, but we clustered the schools, for example, the schools in St. David's, so they could all come in and benefit from the training and children who had the natural inclination to um, do woodwork, for example, could start their training at the primary level. And there could be any combination. You see, school is about putting subjects that address the talents and skills of the children. It will hold their interest if it is what they, are, they like to do. And so with that same idea, we introduced the performing arts, CXC Performing Arts in 2011. And the students in Grenada did remarkably well. I remember we put in a group of 11. And out of that, they must have gotten about eight or nine distinctions. They performed tremendously well. But getting back to the idea that you have to put into the school what the children are interested in, music, um, whatever aspect, where their God-given talents lie, and they will flourish. Your discipline issues would also go down. So it is with all of that in mind, the technical education was reintroduced because it was removed in 2006, a phenomenon I can't understand up to now. I searched for the five years to see the rationale behind that. Nevertheless, that's what it was. So we reintroduced it and also put in a policy that every secondary school was to offer at least three technical subjects. Um, some went up to as many as 10, places like um, St. Mark's Secondary, SAS, BOCA. These had nine and 10 technical subjects, and we had um, brought all to the level of four, five, at least three because that's where the job market is when the children leave, and that includes computer skills and technical skills in that area. These efforts have not been followed through at all. And as we chat with the um, non-denominational schools, with principals across the board, and as I tra travel around, I get the feedback that that is a big deficit area. There are others, for example, the civic awareness. We had sent 20 teachers away um, to train in the area of civic awareness. Young people and children must understand what government is about and their role in community development. And it's taught in a formal subject, a degree program, which we got the OAS to fund. None of these are following through. I have a little, um, which is unfortunate because it means the children are not getting exposed at all to the natural growth processes that should take place in terms of community development and um, what is happening at that level. I have in my possession here a number of book booklets that we used in terms of anger management and conflict resolution, another area that seems to have fallen by the wayside. Um, actually, it's very interesting how this came about Blossom, because I remember being called one evening about 8.30 
in the night after cabinet meeting and told that a gentleman, gentleman called Nielsen Waits is in Grenada for one more night, which was the night that I got to him, and I could have an opportunity to chat with him. This gentleman apparently is the man who introduced anger management and conflict resolution to the schools in Barbados. Subsequent to that, they had introduced it in Antigua. So these are not things that Grenada is first in, as they're making us believe. We are way behind, way behind in this regard. So I had a long chat with this gentleman, and he promised to come back and to chat with parents and as to the role and importance of having courses like this. And then we will try to introduce it to the schools and so on. The long and short of the story is that it rolled off very well. We were able to get the booklets, uh, simple booklets called Anger Management and Conflict Resolution. You see, we're looking for children to be able to handle their conflict as adults and also as children growing up. The answer to the, to the fight is not the cutlass. There are about seven or eight steps that one can take in conflict resolution before you get to the level of a weapon. Now, our young people, because they have not been taught to think otherwise or analytically, soon as there's a difference of opinion, the cutlass is the next thing that's swinging into action. But you have to nip these things in the bud. You have to introduce this to young people and children. And this course should have been followed through by the counselors in all the schools. So by now, we should have had a good conflict resolution um, course as part of the personal development skills. Um, when one looks at, for example, the recently concluded case of Ariel Bola, and saw that it is a 17-year-old that has received sentence about what happened to her. When I look back, that young man would have been in school five years prior to that and should have been into the whole issue of anger management and conflict resolution. Um, and perhaps the outcome would have been quite different had he been taught how to handle himself. I know, for example, in Wesley College, um, we had a really good uh, feedback because the counselor there was systematically going through how this um, process should be. The examples are very practical, you know? And I would have loved to have read one or two little examples the children would relate to. It's a little booklet, and we ordered about 10,000 of them because they were being given to us to get into all the schools so that the children could benefit from this. Actually, the teachers ended up taking, every time I went to a school and spoke about this, they wanted, invariably wanted, three or four of the booklets to use. Because as young adults themselves, we all want to know, how do you manage conflict? How do you um, deal with anger management and so on? So I am deeply concerned that none of this seems to be followed upon. We had a whole series of, of public forum. I have one um, pattern sitting right here near to me, and in which we spoke of things like boys under achievement. The males in our society are under achieving. And a um, complete analysis by Harewood was done. It was presented back to us at um, Paricom. And, uh, you know, the, the whole matter was discussed. Why are the boys in the Caribbean region underperforming? Have the girls suddenly come alive? Is this anything to do with this? You know, because the girls have come alive. No, in actual fact, the facts that he found was that it, the subjects were not being taught in a manner that interested the young men and got them going and got things happening. It was not very hands-on at all, and that was found to be the main factor. But the issue is they are underachieving and being outmaneuvered by the young ladies, which is going to have its repercussion. Those young ladies look for young men to marry amongst this group. You want everybody to be advancing, you know? And um, I don't see, I'm not aware of anything happening in that regard. To me, this government has dropped the ball with the education completely. And I thought NDC had developed a critical momentum that did really um, 
addressed the issues because as a developing nation, you cannot develop without a powerful education system to um, empower your uh, young people and to train them to think analytically and so on. Before um, you go on, Mrs. Bernadine, let's just take a quick break and then we're going to come back and continue the discussion. This is Excellent. this is to the point of speaking with political leader of the NDC, Franca Alexis Bernadine. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be right back. The Grenada Food and Nutrition Council remind you to boost your immune system and give yourself a fighting chance against COVID-19. Consume foods that are rich in vitamin C, like fruits and vegetables, for example, oranges, grapefruit, mandarin, lemon, spinach, cabbage, and tomatoes. Vitamin B6 and folic acid that is found in chicken, turkey, fish, grain foods like oats, bread, local provisions, dry beans and peas. Another immune system booster is vitamin E found in nuts, corn, sunflower or canola oils and leafy vegetables like spinach, broccoli and kale. Iron, zinc and vitamin D are also important to strengthen your immunity. So try foods like lean meats, eggs, lentils, mackerel, tuna and jacks. Our local spices ginger, clove, and turmeric, among others, can help decrease inflammation and support the immune system. Remember to practice safe food handling. A message from the Grenada Food and Nutrition Council reminding you that a strong immune system is one of the best ways to fight COVID-19. As a result of our coverage of this year's Hero CPL, there will be some adjustments to our programming lineup. The GBN Evening News will feature immediately after the CPL match, while transitions would come after the GBN News. GBN, with you anywhere and everywhere with sports coverage. Welcome back to To The Point. We're speaking with political leader of the National Democratic Congress, Franca Alexis Bernadine. Uh, Mrs. Bernadine, I think it was last week, Friday, at the sitting of the House of Representatives, or possibly the sitting before that, uh, it was announced in the House that um, government was thinking about reintegrating students or pregnant young pregnant mothers into the school system outside of the program for adolescent mothers or as we know it pam what do you think about that that plan or that yes, thought yes indeed indeed um i did hear it and i think there was a newscast last night as well on it and pam has a very unique position in terms of empowering in education it is about picking up those who fell on the sides and giving them an opportunity again to get what they need to and given the support that's what it established given the support um they did very well i see quite a few of them all the time it is time to make a poster of them and how they have progressed indeed very sadly to mention one of the first um 
graduates of the PAM program. Um, unfortunately, passed away. She was the manager of Cedars, and uh, she passed away, went to her funeral day before yesterday. But what was outstanding about this young lady is that having left school at 13, St. Joseph's Convent, Grenville was where she attended, and having been given the chance to regroup again, she got nine CXC subjects. By the time she left PAM, she had nine subjects with five distinctions. Um, we helped to support her and her mother to put her through TAM CC. She got A-level economics and A-level um, literature along with um, GP, I think it was. And that really is enough to get her into law school if she wanted to go in there. And um, did extremely well. And that's the point about PAM. Now, the thing is, we tried once before, and I want to caution about this, the cultural norms of the society are very, very critical in running a program like that. It's a sensitive program at the best of times. And certainly, while you want to have students um, attend back in the regular school, um, what, what proved very significant was the response of the society. They took an adamant position with respect to children coming in who had, in fact, had children before. That is the religious and cultural norm of the society. And attention must be paid to these things. Um, perhaps a combination of the two. Maybe you certainly need your PAM, PAM project. And you will find young ladies like Janelle coming and attending and doing well, very well, and picking back up and getting into the system again. But we tried one young lady at Boca Secondary. I cautioned against it. I'm sure Mrs. Brenda Hood would remember when I expressed my concerns because it is not being handled. It's a matter of whether the society will accept it or not. Regrettably, and that young lady was a bright young lady again, good person to try. And she had dropped out at an early age, 13, from the Anglican High School. She never settled. They gave her hell in that school for the entire time, subtly and otherwise. And um, it created such a furor. They thought that by confronting, confronting is never the way to do these things. Confronting and facing off would be the way to force her into the school. She did attend, and I kept in touch with her mom and herself. She never was accepted. It gave trouble socially. Um, it, the experiment did not work at all. Um, contrast that too to another young lady who got pregnant at 10, just turning 11, and gave birth to twins. Now, we were, because she was so young, we tried to get her back into, after she had delivered her babies, had settled, because the whole trauma to her body as a child herself is a factor you have to look at. But having, she having um, come through the experience, the children were, did very well and were doing okay coming along, we tried her back into the primary school. We had to counsel the staff first and do several counseling sessions with the PAM, um, with the counselors from PAM and the staff. And the principal was extremely supportive. So we knew that she would have been well sheltered and she managed to complete, at least to get to school leaving level. But ever so often, and pretty often, the principal had to intervene and took a firm stance and um, backed off the boys in particular, who harassed her at the school, at the primary school where she was, and she went through a lot of teasing with mother and whatever else. So I am saying that we must bear in mind the cultural norms of our society and what is acceptable to people and what is not. And certainly, if there are one or two empathetic principles, then you can manage to work the program through. But the idea of doing away with PAM to, so that you can force children back into school is our work in this country. Um, Jamaica had a similar experience where I spent three weeks, UNDP sent me up for three weeks to look at the program up there. And Mrs. Pam McNeil, who is the founder of the whole program, um, explained very clearly that they could use selected principals who were empathetic and could really follow the young lady very closely and support because there's often resentment even at the staff level. That is the reality of the Jamaica experience. So they 
kept the women's center, as theirs was called. They had 11 branches throughout the island. And the point about it is that the young ladies were getting the opportunity, having made the um, error. Please note that the young men will never take two to make a baby, but the young ladies carry the brunt of the problem. And you don't want to pull down the young men. You want everybody lifted up. So the opportunity must be given, but counseling should also have been introduced in our um, primary school and our secondary school system, particularly for the third, fourth, and fifth form boys. These are not happening at all. Blossom, this is the little booklet here on um, anger management and resolving conflict that has become very much a part of school in um, the Caribbean. Notice the angry face here. But it's a little booklet, and it's very simple, but it draws on examples. Like, Margaret is a very angry young lady because she's been sexually harassed at her home by her stepfather. Therefore, when she is in class, she is angry and strikes out. It gives practical discussion on the sources of anger for Caribbean children and so on. It is very disappointing to know that 10,000 of these remain in the ministry for the last seven years. I don't know where they were in the basement and things like that are, are disheartening. This is about stopping violence in schools that we brought from, I brought in my hand one copy for every school from the UNESCO meeting. And violence, the reduction of violence in school is not by coincidence. It is by careful implementation and maintenance of all these different thrusts. So I just wanted to say, this is another one, end violence in schools. This one is about gender-based violence in schools. So educating is, a, is an active process that requires that sort of constant input, support for principals, etc., along with upgrading significantly the levels of the um, teachers who are willing, by and large, willing and hardworking individuals who deserve to be supported. What we did was to provide, pay for their first and second year of their degree course, and then allow them to try and um, get pay for their third year and then get their degree in an attempt to lift the cohort. Because Grenada's cohort of educated, quote unquote, teachers, degreed and trained, is very low. We brought it from 20% in 2008 to 50% um, in 2013, which the Ministry of Education report will reflect in the 2013 December report. Since then, I understand that, you know, we have gradually slipped back down so that you're getting in with basic qualifications again. And um, sometimes you find children brighter than unable to, by, by nature they are, some of them may be brighter than their teachers, but the teacher must have the background knowledge. You must have the base in the woodwork or in the, um, the biology or whatever to be able to teach the children. And then most importantly, the skill of imparting that knowledge. You need to know who is an audio learner, who is a visual learner, who is a logical learner and would do well in math, but not as well in the written forms. This is all part of standard education in today's world. Grenada is getting left behind by miles, even within the Caribbean. Do you know, Blossom, that they came to get about two to get about 200 applicants in woodwork, for example, to um, for the building of certain hotels in the Caribbean, and we could not get what with all the talent that we have, brilliant woodwork people. They wanted a CVQ level four person, minimum. Level three, four, I believe it's up to five now. Um, to quite, we couldn't get a single Grenadian in the cohort, but St. Vincent got about eight. You know, you have to look at the factors and understand that you're slipping and losing ground, that you cannot afford to slip and lose. One, we are building a nation and building a country. It has to be built on a foundation of education. And two, you need to be not only qualified, not only um, 
part of the foundation, and but it breaks the poverty cycle in the Eastern Caribbean. So it has an additional benefit. And you see, that's where you become politically cynical, because it could only be that I don't need you to be empowered because I need to control your life. And this is where NDC values and good governance practices that people may not see up front. You're so busy studying the money, and rightly so. You have to eat, you have to survive, that you don't see what you are sacrificing for that. But well, instead of being empowered to break your poverty cycle, you have to um, settle, you know, you settle for plenty less. But these are my some of my concerns with respect to the present operating of the education system. Thanks, and over out. <laughs> yes. die, no. I was enjoying uh, the conversation, but unfortunately, we have to end the program here. But I'd like to thank you for spending some time with us. And of course, we will continue to extend the invitation to you to join us here Lovely. on To The Point. Lovely. Thank Lovely. you. Continue to stay safe. Thank uh, you so much for the opportunity to be able to say all of that. And I will, and you as well, and to all the listeners out there, keep the faith journey on make sure those children get whatever there is to be gotten with the combination of the books and of the um the tablets whatever it is we're journeying this together, together. and this is solidly with you thank you very much have yourself a good tuesday mrs bernadine thank you very much Political leader of the National Democratic Congress, Franca Alexis Bernadine, would like to thank her for being our guest this morning and thank you, our viewers and listeners, for participating and viewing and listening the program. We have to end to the point here as we prepare to broadcast this morning's CPL match between the Jamaica Talawas and the Trinbago Knight Riders, which would get on the way shortly. And that's the end of my time today. I'll be back with you tomorrow, God willing. Until then, stay safe, be good. If you can't be good, be cautious. Have yourselves a very blessed Tuesday. Broadcast of CPL 2023-2024.